And just for comparison, this is a, a fruit and vegetable farm uh, in another neighborhood of Havana. To this year, Israel's Ministry of Tourism is offering each of those all-white nominees a free multi-thousand dollar trip for two. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. Our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. The U.S. Embassy in Iraq put out an extraordinary warning of a possible collapse of an immense dam on the Tigris River that could result in a sudden flood of water that could kill, in the estimate of the New York Times, hundreds of thousands of people. It could go all the way to Baghdad. The dam was built in the 80s. It was built very badly and has to be constantly maintained. It was captured briefly in 2014 by ISIL. Engineering companies, though, have been afraid to go back since. And since 2014, the dam hasn't been maintained. The peril is greatest right now because the water is highest in the Tigris on that dam from the middle of February through May. The U.S. Embassy is advising that people who live in anywhere within six kilometers from the river evacuate. That's hundreds of thousands of people. Incredible. It's another unexpected consequence from the shock and awe invasion and occupation of Iraq. The US and British and other allies who attacked Iraq should pay the billions for the evacuation and resettlement. As we record, there's a partial ceasefire in Syria. It was brokered by Russia and the US. A lot of fighting has in fact stopped, but one part of the agreement, the easing of the sieges, has not been put into effect. We start with a minute of video from Daria, southwest of Damascus. Scores of women and children joined in a silent protest to highlight their suffering. The city has been under siege for four years and is under constant bombardment. Government forces have not permitted any food or medical aid to reach the 8,300 civilians living under the siege. While pounding them until the ceasefire with scores of barrel bombs on a daily basis. We've talked about Madaya and Moadamiya in Syria. Daria may be the one whose situation is in fact right now the most grave. المدنيين في مدينة دارية 21-2-2016 اعتصام المطالبة بدخول قوافل الأمم المتحدة ووقف القصف عن المدينة Now, part of a talk by Brian Tokar of 350 Vermont, author of Towards Climate Justice. He talks about Cuba, a country that underwent an emergency when Russian aid stopped in the 90s, but who have used these emergency measures for permanent climate progress.
Okay, ready for the next one? Yep. Pause it. There's a lot to talk about because, of course, it's a, a really interesting and unique time in Cuba. I had the chance to be part, as Chris said, of a, a tour focused primarily on organic farms and co-ops and some of the experiments in agroecology that are going on there. Um, and it was organized through a group called the Center for Global Justice, which is based in San Miguel in Mexico. And we had a pretty diverse group, about 10 of us who signed up either through that group or the Organic Consumers Association, which I hope you're all familiar with. Um, and then there was a group of uh, 15 or 20 people from, of all places, South Dakota State University. So you'll see a mix of students and props and also our crew, which was mostly um, in their 50s and 60s, a couple of guys were older, and uh, it's an interesting mix. Um, <clears throat> so, just a little bit of background, get everybody up to speed. Uh, folks are aware that Cuba was heavily supported by the Soviet Union in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. When the Soviet Union fell apart in the early 90s, Cuba went through a really difficult period where there were severe food shortages. Uh, the average person, somebody told me, uh, lost as much as uh, uh, the, the average diet, I'm sorry, lost uh, a third of its caloric value. And with the lack of um, petroleum and agricultural inputs of various kinds. Um, they entered into an experiment uh, to create a different kind of agriculture, one rooted in, uh, of course, very old ways of growing food organically, uh, combined with some of the latest methods. And uh, Cuba has a something like triple the per capita population of scientists of Latin America as a whole. So a lot of people with a lot of knowledge really put their heads toward trying to create a new agricultural system. And that continues till today, uh, although, as we'll see, there are many problems that have arisen. Uh, due to a combination of world events and, of course, uh, a year's worth of uh, increased diplomatic contact with the U.S., for example. The week before I was there and with this group, uh, Tom Vilsack, U.S. Agriculture Secretary, made a trip with a whole group of agribusiness uh, senator, U.S. senators from major agribusiness states. So there's a lot of tension around uh, how to sustain these experiments in the face of international pressure, in the face of some internal pressures. We'll get into some of that. So this is uh, Jose Marti uh, International Airport. This is the terminal where uh, flights from the U.S. come in, which is the old part of the airport. <coughs> Apparently there's a modern airport on the, uh, across the way where flights from Europe and Canada uh, that aren't under the same restrictions that we are. In order to go to Cuba, you still, to fly from the U.S., have to be part of some kind of organized tour with a specific educational purpose. But the plane we flew on, even though we were not only on a charter flight, was an American Airlines plane, which was kind of a surprise. So you see uh, modern European and Japanese cars, but also uh, the famous uh, restored 1950s cars that, that everybody knows are uh, common in Cuba and they've developed a lot of uh, technology to keep those cars on the road and this is just the spur road uh, outside the perimeter of the airport and, and you see a lot of those and, and we'll see more of them. Uh, and this is the vehicle we were traveling in, a, a funky old school bus that a Canadian pastor had donated to a Cuban school a number of decades ago, now owned by an organization called the Martin Luther King Center in Havana, which uh, provided our guide and our translator. 
and this is about half of our group. The woman in the middle, her name is Eloisa. She was a, a top government translator. She translated for Nelson Mandela when he was in Cuba. She translated for the first pope who came to Cuba a number of, uh, about a decade ago. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now she's uh, helping people from around the world learn about what's going on. And you see the most of the older folks you see were part of our uh, circle, and then the, their, the students are all from, from South Dakota. So this is the old part of Havana. We'll just start with just, some, uh, just a few slides from uh, our days in Havana, and then we'll get into the, the farms. This is the old Spanish fortress that goes back to the... 16th century, I'm pretty sure, and it's it's right along the uh, right right it's it's right on the on the coast there on the north coast, which is where Havana is located in the northwestern part of the island. Cuba is, of course, long and narrow. It's about 800 miles across, but only a day's drive from north to south. Um, so that's the old Spanish fortress and the old Spanish cathedral. Uh, something you might notice is the two towers are very different from each other. They were built at different times, so they're kind of asymmetrical. Uh, and the old Spanish architecture in this part of town is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, this is the old colonial capital, and the statue is of a uh, Dominican revolutionary who worked with Jose Marti to help liberate Cuba from Spanish control in the 19th century. This is one of the well-known squares in the, in the center of Havana. And here, of course, is the notorious U.S. Embassy, which has always been there as a U.S. kind of uh, <coughs> Headquarters. Uh, it was called the Cuban, the U.S. Cuban intersection, or something like that. And uh, just a year ago, it, uh, or less than a year ago, it was uh, re-established as the U.S. Embassy. And they've tried to. The, the the U.S. government at various times has kind of tried to make it a a really highly visible symbol of the U.S. Presence and used it to advertise various U.S. things. So right across the courtyard, uh, the Cubans <laughs> put that up. <laughs> uh, and this is typical street in a residential part of Havana. Um, the the kind of boxy looking cars are actually mostly Russian. And then uh, there are some European and Japanese ones, and not too many of the old American ones on this particular street. Um, one of the things that's striking about Havana, over the last decade or so, there's been increasing economic inequality. And you can see, really, from one block to another, um, classic old Spanish-style houses that are in beautiful condition. and you know, on the next block, uh, apartment blocks that are, are really visibly crumbling. Uh, they really are having a difficult time. And of course, the 50-year-long, 55-year-long uh, US embargo is a significant part of that. At the same time that <clears throat> the Obama administration is working on restoring uh, diplomatic relations, they're also still suing foreign companies and banks that are violating the U.S. embargo by doing business with Cuba in ways that are outside the realm of, of what's authorized. Um, this is more tourist-oriented uh, part of town, and uh, a lot of these old cars, the ones that are really painted up, are, are run as taxis. And I didn't really ask, but I have a feeling people pay a lot of money to ride in those. Uh, one of the odd things about Cuba is it's got two currencies. The traditional Cuban peso is currently worth about four cents. And then there's a peso that's convertible to international currencies that's pegged to the dollar. 
And for people who are getting paid in the old Cuban peso, which is the vast majority of people still, um, it's really a struggle to get by because prices are rising and what's happening is people are more and more dependent on, on the tourist economy. So you hear about uh, highly skilled professionals, engineers, physicians making you know, 20, 30, sometimes $50 equivalent a month and then needing to supplement their income by participating in the tourist economy in some way by uh, selling things to tourists, by working as interpreters, translators, guides, and because of that there's a lot of hustle including, uh, you know, people who fix up these old cars just on every corner trying to grab people to, to take a, a taxi ride, but it's, it's a lot more than a taxi ride. Uh, for people from Europe, for people from Canada, uh, people go to Cuba to sit in cafes and places like this, and of course also uh, to be by the ocean. Uh, and there's a whole resort area uh, to the northeast of Havana, where I, I know a lot of Canadians go, uh, and all along the coast, the whole length of the island, there are places that are significant European enclaves. And in the last year, tourism has gone up something like 30%, and people have this difficult relationship with it. On the one hand, they need the income. On the other hand, it really distorts the economy. It distorts the culture in ways you can imagine and also in some surprising ways. For example, even with all the urban agriculture, which we'll see some of that's uh, become established <coughs> in Havana and other cities over the last 20, 25 years, uh, there's still a significant shortage of fruits and vegetables in Havana. And it's because it's all kind of getting grabbed up by the big resorts, by the privately owned restaurants that have proliferated in the last 10 years or so. And there's music everywhere. It's really, the music in, in Cuba is, is so great. And there are people playing music on the street, and there are people playing music in every restaurant and club and little cantina, and out on the beach, of course, uh, near the coast. And it's uh, the analogy that, that came to mind was with New Orleans. If you've been in New Orleans and know what it's like to be in a city where there's just incredible music everywhere, Havana's really the same way. And this is a park right in Havana, and I was surprised to see banyan trees, which of course are, are native to, to India and other parts of South Asia. Um, and of course, like in many places in the tropics, plants that you might grow on your windowsill, just uh, growing in, in the middle of the woods like this. And then the other thing that maybe you know about Cuba are the billboards, and this is in the this is the same park. There's a river that goes through the park, and that's kind of the the um, headquarters of the park. And on the side of it are quotes about the importance of preserving nature from Marti and Fidel Castro, and of course Che Guevara. And the images of especially Fidel and Che are everywhere. But also uh, billboards with quotes from well-known international figures. You see quotes from Gandhi and Mandela and uh, Victor Hugo is a popular one. He apparently lived there uh, for many decades uh, in Havana. Um, so the, the political education that happens through uh, signs on the streets and, and in the parks and, and various places uh, is something that's still uh, really prominent there. So this is a residential neighborhood in Havana and there's a fairly large uh, vegetable farm uh, right there in this residential neighborhood. Um, it's, you will get more of a sense of the scope of it in, in a minute, but it's really a much bigger scale than you would see in an urban neighborhood, certainly anywhere here. The only place I've been where I saw 
um, large-scale food growing uh, to this extent in cities were um, some places in Japan. And this is the same place. Uh, just before we saw the houses and the street and the neighborhood and this is, is right there. And uh, a lot of the kinds of practices that we saw demonstrated on a larger scale and some of the larger farms we visited are, are happening here as well. The flowers planted as uh, trap crops for pests and to attract birds and beneficial insects and butterflies like many of us who garden here in New England do, but on a much more elaborate scale because it's the tropics and because of the, the biodiversity that's possible there. Coconut tree, right in that same, uh, that same little, uh, that same lar largish garden plot, small farm right on the edge of the city. And the greenhouse is uh, mostly used, uh, and there's another slide that that I don't have here where you see a canopy, a kind of a mesh canopy, and they're mainly used for, for shade so that greens that want a cooler climate can grow through the, the hot Caribbean summer. Uh, banana trees over in, in that grove there with the, the coconut palms uh, covering over them. And this was, the, this was late November, this was a couple of days uh, the week before Thanksgiving and through Thanksgiving week is the time when I was there. So it's the beginning of the rainy season, so starting to plant the next season's greens uh, is one thing that's happening. And then right across from there, there was just a guy selling uh, bunches of greens from uh, <coughs> that same large garden, small farm. Uh, and just for comparison, this is a uh, a uh, fruit and vegetable farm uh, in another neighborhood of Havana to just uh, give you a sense of, of, of what's there. The tropical fruit, of course, is amazing, but there are lots of places uh, in Havana where, where you can't get it. So, um, we started uh, taking the, the school bus to interesting places to visit farmers on the outskirts of Havana over the first uh, five, six days. And then the last several days, you'll see <coughs> we traveled further out into the countryside uh, for a change of scene. Um, don't have this guy's name written down. His farm is called Dos Hermanos. It's him and his brother that founded it just a few years ago. A lot of these farms are on <coughs> recovered plantation land that was used to grow sugarcane, that was used to grow uh, large-scale citrus. Um, and since the 90s, <coughs> and at a much more rapid pace, over the last 10 years, the government has been giving use rights to people who want to farm uh, to patches of land. And they've uh, given out uh, over the last 15, 20 years, something like uh, <clears throat> a million hectares of land. A hectare is two and a half acres to something like a hundred thousand people, I think, is the is the number uh, over this period of time. And what he's demonstrating here are the seeds of this tree. I mean, the broad leaves you may recognize as a banana tree, and we'll see a lot more bananas growing in just a bit. But this other tree with the the puffy red balls is called bika, and it's used in the Caribbean as a substitute for saffron for coloring and flavoring rice. To see his full talk, go to our YouTube channel. The easiest way to do that is to go to thestruggle.org and click on the big green link at the start of the website.
Apartheid Adventures says, Thanks, Oscar. You're really striking a blow for inequality with your second year in a row of all-white nominees for acting. And since inequality is what Apartheid is all about, Apartheid Adventures Fun Field Vacations in Israel would like to show our gratitude with a little Apartheid addition to that special $200,000 gift bag that marketing company Distinctive Assets gives each of your major nominees just for being, you know, them. This year, Israel's Ministry of Tourism is offering each of those all-white nominees a free multi-thousand dollar trip for two so they can see the real Israel in all its apartheid glory. Not the Israel you see on the evening news. The real Israel is full of cool, hip people, if they're of the correct ethnic religious category, and we mean to keep it that way. Inside Israel, we've got 50 laws that discriminate in your favor if you're one of the cool, hip people who are of the correct ethnic religious category and against those other people who are not. And we're moving more and more of our cool hit people of the correct ethnic religious category into the West Bank where they live under a separate set of laws with special rights and privileges those other people don't have. Two different sets of laws for two peoples under one government? Now that's real apartheid. And we're keeping those not cool hit people in Gaza under control. In fact, we control their borders, seacoast, airspace, water, electricity, city imports, exports, even their food calorie intake. In fact, really, we keep them in an open-air prison. And when they complain or make any trouble, we shut them right down, non-combatants and all. Real Israel, real apartheid. But some people are a little squeamish about apartheid because it's a crime against humanity, whatever. So we've been working hard to improve the image of what we call brand Israel, what you might call brand apartheid. So Oscar nominees, if you love inequality, segregation, and open-air prisons. We hope you'll accept this free trip to Israel because just by showing up, you'll help us in our struggle to put a good face on apartheid. Apartheid Adventures. Ethnic privilege at affordable prices. Finally, some pictures from a memorial service for Connie Peixoto. If you ever visited near the White House, you may have seen her makeshift peace vigil on the, a sidewalk near a fence. She held it continuously for 35 years. She was fiercely anti-war and opposed to Israeli apartheid. Rest in power, Connie. That's our program for today. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle. <laughs>